Um, officially, our seminar should come to a close now. But of course, we actually still have the most exciting and interesting part, which is ahead of us, which is the panel discussion. Uh, we are in a democratic society. I want to seek your consent. Uh, would you be agreeable to staying behind for another 20 minutes? So it will mean for those who have signed up for the lunch and the workshop will have to cut short their lunch by 20 minutes. And for those who have other appointments, you might be late for 20 minutes. So let's have a show of hands if you think you can afford to have another 20 minutes of panel discussion. Please show your hands. Yeah, it's a majority. So, <laughs> what? 30 minutes. <laughs> now, let us invite our guest speakers on the stage again. Uh, Florence, Jeff, and then we have a new speaker joining us, Mr. Queen's Jong from Cathay Pacific, Director of Corporate Affairs. And our facilitator for the panel is Ms. Ada Wong. She is the CEO of the Hong Kong Institute of Contemporary Culture, a very passionate champion of social innovation in Hong Kong. Now, without much ado, I'll hand over the floor to Ada. Christine, you're supposed to be up here. Mr. Key, if you are not too much rushed rush for time, also. you can join us. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for staying behind. I think after listening to four excellent and inspiring speeches, it is time for dialogue. It's time you know, to digest what we've heard. Um, I'm actually very fascinated about social innovation. And this morning, I heard a lot. And, and I think there's one thing that I would like to focus on in the next 10, 15 minutes, and that is um, social innovation, or the most creative social innovation, actually uh, begins or you know, happens at cross boundaries, you know, at the boundaries of different sectors, the government, the, um, the market, the NGO, and the household economy. And, um, and I hope that we can um, uh, think about how to communicate better between the different sectors and how to collaborate better, for, you know, between the different sectors. Um, Quince, uh, Quince is right here on my left. Uh, Queens is actually director of uh, corporate affairs at Cathay Pacific, and um, uh, Cathay Pacific has done a lot in CSR and actually more than CSR. Um, so, so I want to ask uh, Queens, you know, since we're talking about communication, if um, let's say if you were the uh, secretary for home affairs and you've got this huge budget, you know, even bigger than what Cathay Pacific has, you know, what would you do that the secretary is not doing now, um, Queens? <laughs> Well, thank you, Ada, for such an uh, uh, interesting question to start with, uh, which I don't expect. But anyway, um, well, if I were the Secretary for Home Affairs, I would be too happy uh, to take on that job because I think, you know, home affairs play a very important role in engaging the community uh, across Hong Kong. And uh, if I were, you know, them, if I have money, I have the budget, I would use it in a prudent manner. I think, you know, as with any a government, that you need to, you know, use the public money in the most prudent manner. And I, I do think that, you know, our Secretary for Home Affairs has been doing a good job in that way. So how would, how would I be able to do more in uh, social innovation? I think the role I see that, you know, um, I should be like a, you know, um, a catalyst, uh, provide the direction, uh, be able to provide, you know, the information, the uh, data to show which are the, you know, underprivileged group that are most in need of um, uh, public support. And I would also be the match matchmaker, matching between, you know, the private sector and the NGOs. Um, just say, for example, Cathay Pacific, we receive a lot of requests from time to time, but we do have our priorities that match with our business um, um, uh, operation. And sometimes, you know, we will have to disappoint the NGOs. But I think if the government can do, then be like a middleman and they can do a matching, that will save a lot of the time and the resources between the private sector and the NGO and avoid a lot of a disappointment. And I think that being the matching um, uh, matchmaker is a, uh, is a very important role. And last but not the least, of course, um, you know, for any uh, you know, community work to start with, they, also, they always need some, need some seed money. And um, I think you know, government will be in the best position to provide some seed money to start the, you know, the operation. Um, and on this front, maybe I can share with um, uh, Ada and the audience one example of how we actually mobilize, I would say, um, a successful tripartite um, cooperation 
among government, NGOs, and Cathay Pacific. It was actually um, first started by the Hong Kong Outlying Islands Women's Association. Um, they approached us and asked if, um, if we would support them to set up a, a social enterprise in Dongchong with the objective to provide job opportunities for the low-skilled laborers as well as housewives living in the area. Um, and of course, when they first started, they came with a blank paper and they said, you know, we just want to do something. And they said, you know, you can't simply do that. Um, you know, they, they see some opportunity there because uh, we, are, we, we run an aviation kitchen um, at the airport. And of course, there are a lot of low-skilled jobs require processes, for example, uh, washing and cleaning of um, uh, vegetables, craft, uh, cutting of you know, fruits, and all these things actually need no... Uh, specific skills um, and we are doing it in-house uh, we employ you know local um, 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 people would let me to to work in um, the at the kitchen as well um, so we we start to think okay why don't we start from there what about you know starting with a food processing plant um, and again as expected they probably would like us to provide some financial uh, startup and instead of providing them the financial um, startup um, actually you know we um, adopt the approach as what Mr. Key has shared with us. You know, what about our business and our um, technical advice? Instead of giving them the fish, let's give them, you know, teach them how to fish. So we actually get our management team to work with the NGO. Uh, we partner with them, we provide them with the management, management advice and help them first start with, you know, writing a business plan, doing a budgeting, and also help them in doing, you know, a promotional uh, plan. And, uh, and then we help them to look into you know, the, um, the design, the, the process design, which is very important, um, and also provide them with the input on the hygiene requirement for aviation kitchen. And most important at this point, you know, the government play a role in it. They provide a vacant piece of land, not a huge one, but it's good enough for them to have a workshop and that you know, they charge them at a nominal rent. This would then provide the most important uh, startup for this social enterprise. And we are happy that we are their first customer. They started their business last year and uh, we are now outsourcing part of our food processing um, uh, work. Uh, to the social enterprise and we're happy to say that they provide you know job opportunities for uh, part-time housewives who, who can then use their you know their time after you know sending their kids to school to come and work in the in the uh, the plant i think this is one example that you know as a private um, uh, enter uh, private company we're happy that you know on one hand we're doing that csr not just because we like to feel good because we truly believe that you know we don't take our flying traffic rights for granted we need to give it back to the communities that we serve. And this is one very good way to do so. And for, the, for our staff, they found this is a very um, exciting opportunity that they actually can use their business skills to help the needies and something that they can actually engage in community work in a very different way. And at the same time, we got the government to support. Actually, Florence was there to help us to officiate, to bless our opening. And I think, you know, this will be, it's not a huge thing, it's a very small setup. But I think, you know, the experience is very fulfilling for all the three parties. Thank you very much, Greens. Great story. Huh? I think tripartite, um, you know, collaborations are really the best, but actually the hardest. And I think this is where the challenge of social innovation is. Um, I want to turn to Florence. Uh, Florence uh, worked in the business sector in a very big bank before she joined the government. So now you're a government official and you were in the uh, business sector before. You know, what, what do you think uh, we could do to actually narrow the gap and you know, uh, facilitate more understanding and trust between the business sector, government and also NGOs? Perhaps let me wear back my original hat as being from the business sector. From my own experience back then, every year actually we would discuss the CSR budget together at the senior level. And uh, the budget is usually um, bigger than what a charity project or an NGO would, um, would expect. It usually is able to afford a few. But how do we decide which one we will support and not support? There are two key elements that we look forward from either the NGO or the government proposed projects. First of all is how that project would match the theme of the business. For example, um, a company may would maybe they want to focus on say youth, say education, say the environment. And if these projects could meet the themes, then that's the first criteria. And secondly is how the corporate could contribute to this particular project. Besides donating money, the corporate would also look for opportunities to engage its own staff to contribute to the project together, and or maybe its own skill set 
uh, just like the example just shared by Queens for the project that we work together in Tong Chong. Um, it's a project that could employ the part-time housewives from the community. At the same time, it needs some business skills and business knowledge in terms of how to operate the kitchen. And so with um, Cathay Pacific running such a big operations in providing fresh food to the passengers, that's a very good match. And then the corporate could feel that at the same time they could contribute. So that's how usually the CSR budget is being decided within a company. And besides the CSR projects, actually a corporate usually also have a, a large crew of staff. And um, they always look for opportunities to engage their staff for volunteering work as well. So for the knowledge, volunteering is something that we could use to engage the corporate. At the same time, their staff are also potential consumers, like every one of us here. And how to also work out some potential projects or schemes to allow the staff to say enjoy a discount or enjoy the feeling of a beautiful heart, a beautiful mood, and certain consumption outlets provided by the enterprises would be very useful uh, considerations for the companies. And I think uh, now, being working at the government, I would see that if um, to facilitate communication between the corporate and also the entrepreneurs engaging in social enterprises, uh, what our role could be is to help to smooth out the communications and also highlight the areas that are important in the business considerations while also sharing with the business what are the concerns and considerations of our social enterprises and charity organizations. Then with that smooth communication to understand each other and allow the exchange of ideas and thoughts, we would be able to foster stronger development of social enterprises in Hong Kong. Thank you, Florence. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to turn to Christine. Um, Christine, you, um, you sit on a lot of uh, boards and uh, you know, councils, um, giving money to NGOs, you know, like on Sustainable Development Council, etc. Um, but somehow, you know, there are still a lot of social problems out there. But then, you know, the, um, the projects that we grant sometimes um, uh, do not actually fill the gap. So, so I don't know what, uh, what we can do because, uh, I mean, unlike the UK, Jeff said, you know, UK almost has no money left. But I think we're blessed in Hong Kong, you know, our government still has quite a bit of money left. Uh, so, but with, with that money, you know, how do we channel that money and the power and the knowledge you know, behind that, you know, into good use in solving um, the society's problems? Well, well I, I go out to ask for money. I don't have a lot of money to give. I mean, as NGO, we learn to do things with little money and little power and we the the thing is to you need to move people with a cause and tell them that it can make a difference with your one dollar so the impact of giving you have to translate it to whoever's uh, giving it to you and what does it mean to them so that needs not just uh, 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 a smooth uh, presentation, but uh, really you need scientific evidence of what impact that you're doing. So, so I think it's we're having a more and more sophisticated donor uh, uh, environment that people would like to be engaged and would like to see impact. And, and I think these are the ways that we should be moving forward. Uh, and I think one of the, the things I would let add on to the partnership it's uh, I mean we as a council we've been building bridges bridges between government business and the civil society but um, what we're talking today it's bigger than this we're talking about new ways of doing things together we're not just talking about CSR which is good and important but it's add on to what business are doing. We're talking about finding new ways to, to face, to, for social growth or social problems like aging, like young people. Can we find new ways rather than, than just CSR? Social enterprise is one vehicle, but how, I mean, you're good at creative. And, and what are the new ways we have to work together to solve social problems? 
This is beyond CSR, beyond social enterprise, beyond social service delivery. So, oh, I think this yeah, we is have something. to cross boundaries. We have to get people from different disciplines and sectors to sit together, to come up with solutions together. I think it's not only you know just one person, but um, some somehow in Hong Kong, you know, I I think um, there 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 is a lot of uh, skepticism and, and mistrust. And um, Christina, I could just go to Jeff yeah. for this question. This is a question from the floor. Um, and it says, some people have criticized social enterprises for competing unfairly with uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, for example, Mr. Key, Funes has salon. <laughs> um, but on, on the contrary, you know, some success, uh, successful social enterprises develop niche businesses, like um, the funeral um, navigation, you know, um, celebrating James's settlement. What's your view on this? And, um, you know, how should um, social enterprises position themselves? Well, I think it, it's, it's right for foundations, governments, whatever, to help social enterprises in the startup phase because they usually aren't, aren't well-established capital markets. So small business usually has fairly easy ways, relatively easy ways of going to the bank or getting some investment against a business plan which is recognizable to bankers. The problem everywhere in the world has been that the social enterprises generally found it harder to get understanding. Even when they had very good propositions, banks, at least in other parts of the world, weren't very intelligent actually about understanding the propositions. But that should be transitional. We're always trying to move towards them being able to compete on a level playing field uh, and not having permanently so privileged status. And I think that relates to the, this broader question of, of partnership. And I, I just very strongly agree with what Christine said. The most important word in the social innovation language is with. It's about doing things with people. It's about doing things with collaborators, not doing them to people or for people uh, and so on. And that really needs to, 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 to run through everything. But what I would like to see as a method being used more often is actually governments and others throwing out a challenge to everyone. Uh, it might be a challenge of a new kind of service for isolated older people, let's say. If business can do better at answering that challenge, let the funding go to business. If it's a social enterprise that does it best, give the money to the social enterprise. If it's a part of the public sector which can spin off, give it to them. Or if it is some collaboration. But we need, I think, much more systematic, more society-wide challenges of that kind to, to elicit what are the best answers, not to think in sectoral terms business best, public sector best, or indeed social enterprise best. They're only good insofar as they deliver results. And this is, again, where we need the universities involved in evaluating, measuring, and assessing. Thank you. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will ask Mr. Key questions. I would like to um, you know, uh, open this to the floor. And um, let's see whether we have a couple of uh, more questions from you. Uh, we are all social innovators here, so after this morning, we'll all go out there and start to do something, you know, take action. So, some questions, please. But I'm sure there are also mics that, um, you know, and you can speak directly and not just, um, you know, written questions. Okay, this is for Florence. Okay, Florence. How can an individual get government funding for social innovation to make his innovative ideas materialized in Hong Kong? Okay, and this is from Dr. Hao, is that right? Where are you? Okay. Um, you are a Pakistani, you are from Pakistani Students Association, um, right, in Hong Kong? Okay. Right. Um, currently, there are two sources. Uh, one is government, and then the other, of course, is private. And the most important for an individual um, to, sh to, to, to kickstart the process to develop a social enterprise uh, would be, because on the government funding part, we basically we fund some good projects. And we have the advisory committee to look through individual business plans before deciding whether to uh, engage in the project or not. So the individual, um, it would be better if he could share his idea with the organization. Uh, an NGO first, and then to get the NGO support and input on the business plan, and with the NGO to then apply for the government uh, funding. Uh, we have two funds with the government that is supporting social enterprises. One is uh, with our Home Affairs Bureau, and then the other is with the Social Welfare Department. 
on worthwhile projects that could promote good cause in the community. Okay, just to check the Home Affairs uh, Bureau's website. Is that right? Okay. Um, so, um, we have a couple more minutes left. Please, questions. Um, you can direct the questions at um, our panel members or collectively. Wow, this is very long. <laughs> I read this first. So this is from Michael Lai, Chief Executive of St. James's Settlement, Director at Jeff. Recently, a, um, a certain press member criticized civil society in Hong Kong for their involvement in social enterprise and commercial activities. He cited the fact that um, government has granted um, land to NGOs and they now use the resources to generate income. At the same time, create unfair competition. Now, this is the same question again. On the other hand, the Hong Kong government has been encouraging social enterprises as a measure to combat un unemployment and other missions. Also to support NGOs to be more self-reliant. Can you comment on this? Uh, how can we overcome this criticism? I think um, more or less the same question. Just a quick tip, perhaps, Jeff? Well, in many countries, including, I think, Hong Kong, government has given all sorts of benefits to business. It provides uh, <laughs> tax breaks of all kinds. Uh, most of the R&D funding coming from government goes into big business, not into civil society at all. So I think the argument always should be, let's have a level playing field. Let's not have special privileges for civil society, but let's bring it up to the level of what is normal for business, and then let's see who can do a good job. Uh, and as I said before, I think on the business side, we had this strange situation in countries like Britain and America where investment in social enterprises was thought to be very risky, very dangerous, but investment in subprime mortgages and things like that was really smart. <laughs> now again, we're getting a bit of a balancing happening, which is long overdue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this is um, uh, for Queens. Uh, also from uh, friends, uh, our Pakistani friends uh, up there. Um, you know, uh, and the question says, there are a number of young, talented people in ethnic minority communities whose job applications were not entertained or rejected just because they don't speak Cantonese, uh, but they are equipped with a lot of innovative ideas. Do you have any um, solutions to tackle this problem and to um, actually involve Hong Kong people um, on, of non-Chinese background? Well, actually, we have a recruitment policy, which is, you know, on a non-discriminatory basis. We don't discriminate people on their race, on their skins, on their, you know, their, their nationality or their gender. What is what the driver in the, in the requirement has always been whether the job requires certain language that we need to provide the service to our customer. We do actually employ a lot of our Southeast Asian um, um, nationals uh, working as our flight attendants and we also have um, other um, uh, language um, um, colleagues working at the airport. So it's very much work driven. Um, and so, you know, there will be opportunities that, you know, when uh, we recruit, um, you know, flight attendants uh, from Southeast Asia, we need their local language. And I think that's, that is always the uh, overriding principle. Okay. Thank you, Quinn. Last question to Key. Um, this uh, Ken, uh, Ken is very interested in the food in the salon. In particular, um, what do you do to turn a destructive person? originally destructive person, well, I don't agree with the, the word destructive actually, <laughs> to a constructive person. Um, what, what tactics do you use? First, if you are interested in fresh salon, you should come to our salon for a haircut. <laughs> we have a model we call the BCSO model, benefit, opportunity, cost, uh, uh, always uh, self others and also uh, uh, self-efficacy. So we help them is that to tell them what is the career of the hairstylist, that is the benefit part, okay? We're talking about that uh, after they graduate, how can they, if they can be very good in terms of their, their skill, they can go to the central, then earn uh, much uh, better in terms of the salary, etc. But uh, the, other than the benefit and the cost, the, the major uh, factor to help them is two parts, is the significant others and also the self advocacy When we talk about the significant others, that, that was a social capital theory in terms of, the, we talk about in the criminology. We have to help them to rebuild their own uh, and the social level other from those mafia that, that he had been acquainted with in the old days. Okay? So we help them in terms of that they have a, they may, in the auto center, they go to VTC to train those who have new customers. In the hair salon, they also have the, uh, the clients and also other peers, etc. We also uh, uh, have a Christian fellowship in our hair salon. So what is important, in fact, the most important guy is the hairstylist. 
if the hairstyler can really like, work like a social worker, help them and then coach them, teach them how to be turned into a good life and also the volcano skill, they will not want to disappoint that their mentor. This kind of people, this kind of youth, in fact, they, they come with a, most of them from a broken family. Although their father and mother love them, but they don't know how to express it. Okay? They don't know how to express it. Although the teacher maybe really want them to develop, they don't know how to, how, how to help them. So they, they come with an a, a, a idea, impression, all these children, is that nobody loves them, nobody care care them. So they are laughing. That's why they commit crime. Even they are being prosecuted, put in the jail, they do not feel shame because they think that they are laughing. So the most important thing is somebody show them they really care them, love them. Okay? That is the hairstyles. That's why I said that our hairstyles are not only hairstyles. In fact, they are their social worker, they are their mentor. The other part is to build the self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is that they have to have a belief that they, when they commit something, they can do something. But all these juniors, they cannot they do have any self-efficacy. They cannot be a good student. That's why they're being uh, uh, drive out from the school. Even when they try to... Uh, take some crime, okay, they're being arrested, okay, even as a criminal, they're not good enough as a criminal, otherwise they will not put in the jail and they come to us, okay. <laughs> so, so, whenever people come to our hair salon, usually people will try to appreciate our hairstylist and also want to help our, our junior. Then my, my, my son said, don't try to help our junior. Because when you come and say that you want to help, you're putting yourself in, yourself in a higher position than their lower position. So what you should you do when you come to hair salon? You should ask our juniors how to cut out your hair, how to cut it, cut it, etc. How to look beauty. They want to be a teacher. When our juniors become a teacher, they, they find that they are being elevated their ego. Okay? So try to appreciate them. Don't try to appreciate our stars. A lot, a lot, already a lot of people try to appreciate them. But in fact, they are very tough in terms of job. So you can try to how to care them instead of appreciate them. So, that's why when we try to be a social entrepreneur, what he said that we have to have a transformation ourselves as a large volunteer. We always try to help a lot of people. But with mm -hmm. this kind of uh, 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 positioning, in fact, you come with like high power people. In fact, we will not be good. Try to be humble. Try to talk to the service target. And then you appreciate those who are now working in the front line, how to help them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, after this, um, let's all go to Funa Salon. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you know we could discuss more, but this is very much Hong Kong. We are now all dashing to different places. But I hope you still remember, you know, this passion in social innovation after this um, seminar. Thank Back you very Rachel. much, Ada, and our panelists, and also Vishnara. Uh, today is just the starter. We hope that we have whet your appetite, and then you will look for more information, contacts, resources, and start to do your social innovation. And I do recommend that you download the Open Book for Social Innovation from the Young Foundation website. It's really valuable source of uh, references. So for those of you who have signed up for the lunch and the workshop, just move to the theater lounge next door. And for the other friends, we hope to see you very soon again at next Bohemia event. Thank you.